then they have to Well, here you are. Hello, welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Frank Doyle. Uh, Frank is an attorney, and he is the founder of Wealth Plan, a law firm specializing in estate planning, estate and trust administration, and estate and trust litigation. He's been practicing law for about 37 years and is certified by the California State Bar as a specialist in taxation law and probate estate planning and trust law. Today, Frank and I are going to be talking about developments in the area of preserving family assets using a family limited partnership or LLC. And uh, as we get started, I want to caution our viewers that we're just covering some highlights of an enormous area of tax law and rules related to estate planning using family limited partnerships and LLCs. Just a starting point, and particularly we're focusing on developments in this area. Uh, so we want you to get qualified tax and legal advice. And also, our discussion is going to focus in California law. Cal uh, Frank is a California attorney. I'm a California CPA. The rules vary somewhat uh, from state to state. Frank, thanks a lot for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I always uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, you know, talk about family limited partnerships and other estate planning techniques. and. Uh, so I look forward to being on your uh, program. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, uh, as we get started, Frank, we've had a number of developments that have happened in the area of the federal estate tax, transfer tax, and so forth. What is the status of the federal estate tax, and why should substantial individuals still be concerned about avoiding that tax? Well, it's, it's uh, a lot has changed, and uh, the, the biggest thing is we have a uh, you know, a exemption of over $5 million. It's going to be $5,340,000 on January 1st. Uh, so uh, a couple, uh, since each uh, person has one of these exemptions, can, uh, you know, give to their children uh, over $10.5 million. So it really is a game changer because uh, many people, uh, even if they own real property, uh, that real property is uh, is value is going to be under the ten and a half million dollar mark. Uh, so for a lot of moderate size uh, uh, landowners and business property owners, uh, you know the need to do the uh, family limited partnership uh, is not as uh, uh, compelling as it was uh, when we had exemptions of uh, one million dollars uh, for each person so that a couple could only exempt uh, a couple million dollars. So really, the, uh, the big change is uh, with the uh, state and gift tax law, where we've got a, a very large exemption. We also have uh, what we call portability. So it's much easier for a surviving spouse to uh, use the exemption of the deceased spouse. And um, uh, so the estate tax is much less a, uh, an obstacle to uh, family wealth planning than it was uh, previously. In addition to that, what's happened is, of course, the income tax uh, has gone up. Uh, the rates, if, it's, if you're dealing with ordinary income, uh, you're like uh, between 39.6%. You know, For capital gains, we have the rate went up from 15% to 20%. Um, and then the California tax, uh, which doesn't discriminate between ordinary income and capital gain, went from 10% to 13%. So if you take uh, the, um, the uh, income tax capital gains rate of 20%, you add 13%, and then you add on uh, the Obamacare tax, which is about 3.8%, uh, you know, you're approaching 40%, which is... Uh, ironically, the the uh, the 
the estate tax rate. Yeah. So what, what's happened is the income tax has become more of a, uh, a problem and the estate tax less of a problem. So m much of our planning is uh, working to put people in a position where they will reduce capital gains and uh, that generally means keeping uh, uh, properties out of the limited partnership uh, mm -hmm. because we want uh, a full step up in basis uh, as opposed to uh, uh, you know the fractionalized uh, discounted interests. Right. So we sell if they, they have a very substantial family, they've got you know again over the ten million, then the estate tax rate is going to be the forty percent. Well, yeah. And, and so for those families, it's still going to be a concern, but but that's going to be like you know the top five percent probably of the wealth of the country as far as you know. Uh, uh, what families that we're talking about? It's very, it's a very limited group. Correct, and I think um, uh, what what uh, we fa see is you have to be much more engaged with the client in trying to figure out what do they really want to accomplish, right? Uh, and uh, and what's most important to them is it uh, income tax planning. Uh, gift tax planning, estate tax planning, generation skipping tax planning, um, and uh, so the uh, the changes in the estate tax law uh, and the income tax law really have uh, made any attempt to have kind of a cookie cutter approach to uh, limited partnerships uh, dangerous. Okay. Uh, there's one other point that I think that we should cover just very briefly again in covering these highlights. And folks, if you've heard some of these things in this program before, forget us, but you know, other folks may not. And that is the area of estates and trusts and the income tax rates that apply for them. Correct. So, you know, the, uh, the problem with, uh, from an income tax point of view, uh, estates and trusts is you rapidly get at the, uh, the maximum rate after like about 11000 uh, $700, you're right at the top rate, which is 39%, over 39%. So uh, it's very difficult to accumulate um, income uh, at the trust level. You know, the policy of the law is to try to uh, get the income uh, moved out into, uh, you know, into the, uh, the, the hands of the beneficiaries where it's uh, taxed at that level. Yeah. So what's happened is at one time, trusts. Uh, uh, and even estates to some degree were important tax planning advantages. Suddenly now these are uh, items that need to be handled very carefully because we can have very high tax rates, income tax rates that can apply to them at very low thresholds. So the threshold that we're talking about is $12,150 for uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just not very much. Right. Uh, and so it makes it really difficult. Okay, well, let's see here. So maybe we can talk a little bit uh, about uh, family limited partnerships. You know, what are what were the advantages and, and what are some of the disadvantages and and how are we handling those? Well, I think there's a whole non-tax advantage to have uh, having limited partnerships. Uh, and it has to do with management and continuity. And so, um, you know, one of the things, and income tax planning, uh, right? You know, because if you have a family in a partnership, you know, one of the things is you can split the income among the different uh, partners. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we have, uh, you know, many times you have a senior generation, and they're in a very high tax bracket, and uh, the children haven't fared as well, uh, and need, um, you know, not in the high tax bracket, and it just makes uh, economic sense rather than the parents get the money, pay the taxes, and then try to get it down to the, their children, uh, that they, uh, you know, have the money go directly to their children. And we're talking about adult children now, yes. typically, you know, right. so we don't have to, uh, but, you know, adult children. And uh, from an overall perspective, I think that's worked very, very well for people uh, because uh, what that does is it, uh, it mitigates the effect of the the large tax, the high tax rate at the parents' level, right. and um, and yet it, it gets the the children the uh, 
you know, the money uh, directly. What we've, <laughs> we've found is um, one of the things it does <coughs> is, you know, once the children get the money and they have to start paying taxes, their attitude about things tend to change. You know, uh, if, you know, gifts, as you know, are not taxable. So if the parents, you know, get the money, pay the tax at the high rate, and give the money to the children, uh, if it's a if it's a gift, it's not taxable to the children, mm -hmm. and so the children never, you know, experience the uh, the the joy of the the, the tax system, and uh, they they really don't have an understanding of it. But if uh, you know 39 percent of uh, what they get, and if actually it's going to be uh, larger because you know you're going to have uh, ordinary income at 39 uh, percent than you get on the California. You know, you're going to be approaching rates of over 40 percent. Then all of a sudden they say, "Well, gee, I didn't realize that taxes were that significant." And uh, and it gives uh, it does a couple things. It basically gives them an incentive to do some tax planning themselves, mm -hmm. and it also uh, uh, you know makes them really appreciate what their parents have done, uh, trying to uh, get the limited partnership uh, you know set up and and uh, have been able to, to get these properties uh, uh, with the uh, tax system we have in place. So, uh, so that's really kind of a byproduct of setting these up. But the real reason now for setting up a, a, uh, a limited partnership is there's a, there is a real focus on the non-tax aspects. So we can split the income mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. rather than the, uh, the, uh, the parents get the um, they'll have to bear the whole income tax burden. That's number one. Number two is we will, um, the parent, the, we prevent, um, the, we, we mitigate the risk of uh, losing the property in some kind of partition action. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have undivided interest uh, under California law, or I think the law of any state, if you have a undivided, let's say, interest in the property, you can force a sale of that property. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, what happens is, you know, you'll have a family with three or four kids. You know, one of them will get divorced. Uh, in the, the the property interest of the child will get mixed up in the divorce, and uh, uh, sometimes that, that forces a sale of the property uh, because uh, the uh, ex-spouse gets a percentage interest, and she's vindictive against the family, or he's vindictive against the family, and they force uh, a sale of, of the property. And so when you use a limited partnership, it has a way of preserving uh, the family p property uh, for, the, uh, for the bloodline, which, uh, you know, many, many of my clients are, uh, are interested in, in, uh, in doing. And so a family limited partnership is an excellent control vehicle uh, because it uh, protects the, uh, the asset from partition actions, from being mixed up in community property situations, uh, from being attacked by creditors. You know, there's a credit, creditor's protection element of it. You have continuity of management because the limited partners generally will have a, uh, a general partnership structure, typically an LLC or a corporation will be the manager, so you get the family management, uh, you know, uh, situation. And I think, um, the non-tax aspects of limited partnerships uh, are uh, are very much alive and well, uh, especially coming out of a recession, where uh, my experience has been that uh, if you have a family, um, people fared unevenly in the uh, in the uh, uh, the latest recession, uh -huh. and so at least one of the next generation one is going to have some significant creditors problems maybe it's a tax problem maybe it's a uh, a, uh, a bankruptcy maybe it's a, a you know a judgment debtor problem and so it's not so easy to give them an undivided interest in the property that the creditor or the IRS or uh, an ex-spouse can attach and so if we have an unlimited partnership we preserve the continuity you know of management for the family which you know will give the a uh, person who isn't as financially uh, stable as they'd like a chance to recover uh, so they don't lose their interest in the property because of uh, uh, 
you know, their own peculiar financial circumstance. Okay. So, in other words, I guess in a sum, but there is like an asset protection uh, element of this type of an arrangement. Well, a asset protection and what we can what we call uh, you can call it legacy planning, generation mm -hmm. planning. Uh, you know, it's it's an excellent vehicle if you have a particular property that's been in the family, that supported the family, that's the proverbial goose, uh, you know, that laid the golden egg, uh, and you don't when you want to keep that alive. A family part, a family limited partnership is an excellent way. Uh, you know, to do that. Okay. And people say, well, gee, why don't you use a corporation? Well, you don't want to use a corporation typically because there's double taxation at some point. They say, well, why don't you use, uh, you know, an LLC? Well, an LLC um, is um, many times too democratic uh, uh, for uh, the control that the senior generation wants. Um, and uh, so, and the other thing about the LLC interest is there's a there's a separate California tax that applies to the gross receipts. So the limited uh, liability company is not the best uh, vehicle to actually hold the ownership of the property. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a corporation or an LLC as the manager, mm -hmm. you know, the general partner, and that's preferred. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, the vehicle of choice, the family limited partnership is uh, is is uh, you know has a lot of possibilities. Okay. Uh, one thing I just wanted to throw out for people to be aware of and ask their tax advisors about. We, we notice he's, Frank mentioned adult children, so uh, there is a thing called um, the kitty tax, right? Which uh, basically taxes the income of minors and up to I think up to age 26 in some circumstances. Uh, at the parents' uh, at, at the rate. parents tax rate. So, uh, so there is an area that is hard to get the income tax rates. Uh, there are other uh, benefits, though. So. Well, anyway, so you've got some people that may have even had one of these family partnerships for a while, and now they're thinking maybe this isn't the best arrangement for this. Well, so then what do they do? Well, I mean, one of the nice things about partnerships is you can dissolve them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing... Uh, uh, there, uh, you know, you can dissolve the partnership and uh, distribute the, uh, you know, the, the 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 property, you know, among the various uh, partners. Uh, one of the things that uh, that that uh, we've noticed is, you're really talking to the clients who really want to dissolve this partnership, and they're saying, well, well the big incentive for dissolving the partnership is to get the so-called step-up or fresh start basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what we're talking about is for years, you know, there really was this trade-off. In other words, one of the things is the rates and the exemptions have all changed, but the basic structure of the tax has stayed, uh, both the, the income tax and the estate tax and the gift taxes is all stayed the same. So one of the things for years is, is there was always a trade-off between the income tax and the uh, estate tax. And because the estate tax, uh, for a long time, the rates were 55 percent, and it was cash nine months after date of death, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, and you had very low exemptions. Uh, it was the tax that got, uh, from a state planning point of view, everyone looked to uh, uh, mitigate. But now, you know, uh, people basically say, look, you know, what we really want to do is this property is worth six million dollars. We're not. We don't perceive having an, an estate tax problem. What we want to do is get a step up in basis. And I think one of the things that uh, you can do is, uh, you know, structure a situation where the asset, the real property, will be includable in the estate of, uh, you know, the deceased senior generation. Uh, and if that's true, then you're going to get a, uh, you know, a step up in basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, <laughs> so, so you have now, we've had for years the defective trust. Now we can have the defective partnership, mm -hmm. uh, which is structured uh, on purpose to have the underlying asset included in the 
uh, deceased senior generation's estate so that there'll be a new basis. You know, mm -hmm. So, for example, if we bought a piece of property for a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, we put it into a, uh, uh, a partnership, uh, and when the senior generation dies, the properties were $6 million. Well, we may want to have that property included in the uh, senior generation's uh, state tax return, so we eliminate the capital gain. And I think that's something that, um, that I've uh, explored on a couple of occasions with, with clients, to just say, look, we'll just, uh, you know, the IRS has been very strict about the senior generation uh, having too much control. So what we'll do is we'll set up a holy, uh, an LLC. The LLC will be wholly owned by, uh, you know, your mother or your father, you know. Uh, the IRS takes a position that that's, uh, a, um, that's a reason to include the whole property in the uh, estate of your mother. That's what we want. So let's just kind of, <coughs> you know, uh, you know, take the uh, the uh, IRS in the direction that it wants to go, but it's really to our advantage. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of that kind of planning going on, counterintuitive planning. So, uh, you know, one of the things I think that uh, the, that the public uh, doesn't understand is this is uh, a really good time to do some creative estate planning. Um, and, uh, and for me, uh, it's very exciting because uh, every client situation is unique. And, um, you know, there are a lot of situations where you've got properties that are worth 20, 30, 50 million dollars. We want to use the uh, traditional family limited partnership to uh, mitigate estate tax. But many families come in uh, as I've described, and really what they're after is to get a step up in basis. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, through creative uh, structuring, you know, we can accommodate both sets of uh, clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about the California property tax? Is that well, a, that's, 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 that's huge. Okay. That, <laughs> that's, a, that's huge. Okay. I mean, that is the California real property tax issues are, uh, I, I think, where our firm is spending, I would say, fully um, almost half of its time dealing with uh, the uh, California real property tax issues. And, uh, you know, uh, that's an area that, uh, you know, you really have to work on. And um, it's complex, and the county assessors are getting more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it's an area where uh, you have to pay special attention. So right now, you know, when a client comes in, you absolutely have to uh, play the five-dimensional tax chess mm -hmm. of, you know, what's the California real property tax consequence of what we're doing, what's the income tax consequence of what we're doing, what's the estate tax consequence of what we're doing, what's the gift tax consequence of what we're doing. And if we're going to do some planning, we may as well do some generation skipping tax planning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's kind of the, the environment we're in. And many times the California real property tax issues, uh, you know, come to light. So, um, uh, Frank, why don't we just, um, we probably won't be able to talk about, you know, what the solutions are, but let's frame the problem a little bit of, of well, well, why, why, why is the property tax a concern? Well, property tax is a concern because of... Uh, really a, a whole set of very complex, uh, convoluted rules, frankly. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, let's take one, if we have a, uh, let's say, a million dollar piece of property, all right, uh, that's the fair market value. Let's say, let's say it's 1,200,000, and we have three kids. All right, and, the, and there's a reason why we want to give that particular property away. Mm -hmm. Let's say the three kids want to develop it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a, it's a piece of uh, uh, land that needs to be uh, developed. Well, there's a parent-child exclusion under par uh, Prop 58. And it applies to um, the property with an assessed value, not the fair market value, of a million dollars. So the, the, uh, uh, you have to go to the assessor's records, and maybe this particular property is acquired um, 
for three hundred thousand dollars and that's its assessed value way back when that's what we want to uh, accomplish now in order to qualify for the parent child exclusion uh, we have to uh, be very careful because we have to uh, it, it does not apply to entity interest so if we form the partnership and we contribute the property of the partnership we're going to get reassessed if we contribute the property to the children and then the children form the partnership we won't get reassessed and so it's nuances like that that uh, that uh, create uh, you know a uh, uh, you know a lot of the problems yeah so in a nutshell what the issue is is in California we have these rules related to reassessment and that the well, a change the, in ownership yeah so we basically we have a change of ownership rule and so if we have a continuity of ownership then the property isn't reassessed and keeps a low property tax but if uh, if we have certain transfers that happen uh, that represent a change of ownership under the rules then we can have the property be reassessed and suddenly we have a much bigger property tax bill. That's correct. And yeah. so that's certainly uh, California real property tax issues, uh, I would say in this environment, are uh, uh, really have come to the forefront. Okay. Okay. And I think you deal with California real property tax issues first, then the income tax issues, uh, and because of the large exemptions, uh, you know, there is uh, in many situations, uh, there's less of a focus on the, uh, the estate tax issues. Frank, we're out of time. Thanks a lot for joining me today. <laughs> so this is a, a big topic that we're talking about, folks, but I wanted to sort of bring some highlights to your attention. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.